Hey, welcome to the conversation. Let's do some pod festing. It brings together three different conversations from musicians, authors, doctors, environmentalists, and even cooks in their own kitchen. These are real people with real stories. Podfest 40 features singer, songwriter, actress, and podcaster, Minnie Driver. Then we're going to add some fashion sense to our conversation, sharing talk number two with the legendary supermodel, Molly Sims. And we'll wrap things up with one of the best talk show hosts on the planet, the one and only Montel Williams. This is Podfest 40. All right, let's do it. Let's do pod crashing. Episode number 103 with actress Minnie Driver from the podcast, Mini Questions. In the Intimate Talk Show style podcast, Driver asks a wide range of celebrity guests the same seven mini questions to uncover the larger truths that will help us better understand ourselves and the world around us. Mini questions with Mini Driver. We are unplugged and totally uncut. Good morning. I'm well. How are you? I, I got to start from the very beginning here and say that your laugh is so contagious. When you you talking with, with Dave Grohl and the way you were laughing, it was like you guys are best friends. Are Are you? We're very, very good friends. We are. We've been friends for a very long time. That's, that's, that's it, you know, 20, 25 years and it shows. So it's uh, the, the, the way that you can pull the story out of people, because, you know, when, when you read the story of what, what many questions is about, you're going seven, seven questions. I don't get this. But in, in your podcast, you get them to say things that, that are just mind blowing in the way of being transparent and very honest. Well, I think it, it, it helps to be really nosy, which I am, <laughs> and persuasive, which I learned, and uh, curious, because people, people will, they'll leave clues. If you really listen to what someone says, my dad always used to say, you listen to what somebody says, because they'll, they'll tell you exactly who they are. And I can often find the thread, just because I'm curious, that will lead on to the next interesting piece of information so i just i just pull threads and that's that's what i do so basically you you question their answers so that you can go deeper inside the story yeah and 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 it's so interesting how whether it's i think it must just be us human beings is that we when we answer something honestly we leave a doorway open for the conversation to continue like i haven't there have been some interviews that have been more uphill than others but nobody has nobody ever shuts the door because i i do think that people people want to connect and people like to talk and sometimes you just have to find the way to that well how how did you work it in the way that you know in talking with ronan farrell because i've always believed in the theory you can't interview an interviewer because the interviewer is going to win and ronan farrell he, he always tried to interview you but boy you got control of that real fast but you know what i i i have got brothers I got brothers and I have so many male friends and he, Ronan is one of the most brilliant people you're ever likely to meet. Like he, he is, his acuity, his wit, his soul, like it's all vast. But, you know, I, I had a, I had an agenda. Like I really wanted, I wanted to know what he thought about certain things. And, you know, it's problem, it's problematic only because everything that he talked about was interesting, but that's okay. I've, you know, you can, you can bring a conversation back around, um, without being bullish about it. Uh, and you can, you just have to get them to actually bring the conversation around, which I think I did. Well, I wish I would have been a fly in the wall when he told you that he was acting and stuff, because all of a sudden, I mean, I, you, theater of the mind is podcasting and your expression was just, was just priceless because you, it was like, what, what, you know, it, it was basically like you, you're stepping in my world, dude. Oh, he, listen, there's no world. You're going to, there's no world where, where I don't think Ronan wouldn't flourish actually deep space, bottom of the ocean. He'll, he's, He's 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 an he's an amazing example of how if you are curious and if you put in the time, you can pretty much do anything you want. Do you like the theater of the mind of the podcast? Because you're such a natural at it. But but I mean, we've seen you on TV. We've seen you on the big screen. I mean, theater of the mind is is you're inside our hearts and our heads. Yeah. I mean, which is where I feel like this last year has revealed it's it's like it's where we all exist in our deepest, purest form. So getting to explore that and getting to explore that with other people or with other people as a conduit, like it's, it's, it's a bit selfish, this podcast, because I just, I, 
I feel lost a lot of the time, like I think a lot of people do. I want I want to know what's going on and I don't. So this podcast is just a ruse for me to have all my questions answered. Well, did you? And ta- I'm going to keep up. <laughs> did you take psychology? Are, I mean, what, because the way that you ask that question and how calm you are all the way through the podcast is like you, you're such a brilliant listener. Well, I would say that that is the first rule of acting. The first, maybe the first, the first lesson I ever learned as an actor was listen. Don't, don't worry about your lines. Don't worry about remote. Just listen to what the other person is saying and connect with that. Um, but beyond that, it was really my parents. My parents had a really interesting, eclectic group of people who came through our home. And I, I lived in quite a lot of different countries and was exposed to a lot of different cultures. And when you're in a different culture, it's good to be quiet and to listen and to pay attention, to understand how things work and what people are saying. But I find people fascinating. Do, do you think that with, with the popularity of podcasting and the way that it continues to grow, that because you're a musician, you understand music. Do you not think that it's a long form folk sound of music that we are speaking? Therefore, it's conversation, but we're sharing stories like folk songs did. Yes. I mean, that is I've never thought of it like that, but. But yeah, I do. I, I think that I think but also with the division that we are experiencing and if you think about when folk music exploded, like if, even in the 50s that that coffee house version of it, the Bob Dylan version in in New York City, right the way through, that was all in reaction to the Second World War. That was all in reaction to uh these events that were exo, they were enormous. They were outside of ourselves. And what conversation and what folk music does is it brings us back to this micro, which is that we are we're just messy human beings bumbling around this earth if we're lucky for 80 plus years. And listening to each other and telling stories is something that keeps us all connected. One of the things about podcasting is the fact that it's a wide open platform. Do you find yourself at any time going, I understand I'm asking people questions, but somewhere along the line, I, I just want to just share what's in my soul. Like, because I do a thing called the choice, which is nothing but the excerpts from, from the journal. It, it moved through me, the experience, so that I could teach others. Do, is, there, is there a side of you that wants to do that as well? Wow. I mean, gosh, yeah. I Yes, yes, there is. I mean, I think this is all much as much as we like to think it was um about everybody else it's not it's always about us just it's it's always about our experience and how we choose to move through this 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 world so yeah i mean yeah so now with 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 the with the acting with the singing which your 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 last album was just absolutely still incredible and and so with the podcasting now is the the expressions using your vocals is there a writer in you that just has found all these different stages I think definitely yeah I think there definitely is and you are particularly in Hollywood um you're so encouraged to sort of stay in your lane and to not be any kind of a renaissance person because it's deeply threatening it's like well wait a minute are you a, are you a comedian or are you a dramatic actor <laughs> and maybe we can maybe we can embrace you being dramatic tom hanks after you know we can allow a few people to do that but certainly not everybody um so i but i've never had any other choice except to to write music, to write, to talk, to act, to sing, um, to cook, to parent. I think that this is a life of doing, you know, and you do as many things as you possibly can because it's over way too quickly. Yep. Yeah. And you're, you're doing it right on this podcast. And it's, it's one of those things where listeners need to understand that you're very addictive to listen to. You go right into the next one, into the next one. And that, that to me shows that you, you're definitely a pioneer and leader in, in this new age. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for saying that. I'm, I'm absolutely loving doing it. Well, you're, you're, you're doing a fine job and it's, you know, and I'm, I'm glad that Dave Grohl found his wallet, but was that not an incredible story? Isn't it the most amazing story? It's the most amazing story. It really is. And it's all true. Like, it's, it's crazy good. Yeah. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you very much indeed. All the best. You bet. Be brilliant today, okay? Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. 
with down-to-earth charm, humor, best girlfriend, tough love, supermodel next door, Molly Sims. She's got a way of sharing secret tips on how to locate beauty, fashion, fitness, and wellness. You know, the secrets that make an everyday supermodel unbeatable. She wasn't born looking the way that she does on television and in print. Like us all, she had weight issues, bad hair days, and fashion disasters. Though she has graced the covers of Self, French Vogue, Allure, and Cosmopolitan, Molly didn't inherit a secret skinny jean or a perfect complexion. She's had that southern girl hair, made fashion missteps, and endured heartbreak and career setbacks. But what is the secret of Molly Sims? Something has to be there, because she is a flawless supermodel. She's got the look, and she's got the confidence. We are unplugged and totally uncut with supermodel Molly Sims. That is a weird name for a radio guy, Arrow Collins. I like it. <laughs> hey, in this age of stages, we've all become addicted to this thing called new and improved. Yet your book, the more and more that I study it, you're giving us permission to be that supermodel every day by just being ourselves. Absolutely. I, You know, people were always like a little bit like, and I knew I was going to get a little shit for having the title of the everyday supermodel. We're like, oh, I'm going to turn you into supermodel. Let me tell you something. And then Beyonce is really shy, and when she brings out her Sasha Fierce, her alter ego, let me tell you something, she's she's amazing on stage, so I think it's all about bringing out your your Sasha Fierce, your inner supermodel, and being the best you can do, you being the best you can be, and it's not about losing five pounds, my friend. You know, people always think, oh, if I lose weight, if I, I'm going to wear that outfit, or I'm going to do that. It's about embracing who you are and where you want to be. My girlfriend is a really big acting coach in L.A. Her name's Lee Chilton Smith, and she said to me once, she showed a picture, I'm like, oh, God, Lee, I look terrible. Oh, I look so fat. And she was like, you know what? You're going to look at that picture two years from now, and you're going to say, oh, my God, I was hot. Look how good I look. And you know what? Two years later, she was right. So what we have to do now is embrace what we look like now, and but again, where do you want to be? And I think it's a new year, it's a new you. And this is where I am 20 years later. And I'm very honest. I mean, I've been dumped. I've been depressed. I got married later. I've done four careers. I was a unibrow, acne-wearing, you know, fat little girl. The one thing that I love about your book is that it gives you the opportunity to be happy, healthy, and hot. Doesn't that actually start yeah. with liking yourself first? It does. You know, people always, like I said before, people always think, oh, I'm going to be happy when I'm going to be, I'm going to do that when I'm, when I'm this way. It starts about being happy now. And you have no, every day is a new day. And I think I'm a real girl's girl. I love women, you know, I love men, don't get me wrong, but my women are my posse. And I love supporting women and giving them the, like when people ask me questions, I'm like, okay, here, do this, do that, try this, try that. Have you tried that tea? Have you tried that foundation? Oh my God, you've got to go eat at that restaurant. It's so good. Or do you want to lose five pounds? Like I've always been that girl, not because of anything, but because I like it. And because I truly have had to reinvent myself. You know, 20 years ago, I was a college kid at Vanderbilt University eating chocolate chip cookie dough and pizza. And then, you know, a year later thrown into, oh my God, I'm living in Paris. I have no idea what to wear, what to eat, how to walk, how to, how to look. And I study and I still study and I still look at what people do and how they do it. And I think it is giving permission to, to, to try to figure all of that out. But it starts with you. It starts with how you feel about yourself. And my parents gave me that. You know, they truly made me believe that I could do anything. You know, I'm from the South, so go big or go home was my motto and still is. Now, in writing the book, Everyday Supermodel, that meant that you had to step back and interview yourself. What was it like? I for did. You, you had to be open with yourself. What, was it difficult to be able to be honest with yourself as you were doing it? And you, you had to have moments as a writer where you took your hands off from the keypad and you, and you said, oh, my God. I can't believe I well, lived this. Well, especially on the last chapter, I made that happen, you know, talking about how I really did it. And I thought, and then, and then like I looked at that postcard that I sent my parents in September of 94, 
and being like, I think I can make money at this job. I think I'm going to be okay. And it, I got to tell you, even me, like when I found it, I got teary eyed or like looking at that little brownie and Girl Scouts and trying to sell the most amount of cookies, like, you know, and then you look back and you think when you're talking about your dating life and you're so so depressed and you've been dumped and your mother's having to live with you and you start writing about it and you're like, huh. And it was just really interesting, like, and very cathartic to go back and think, wow, all right, I'm it, okay. Is that where you and developed, is that where you developed the lifestyle of you got to hire yourself? If you're going to do it, you just got to hire yourself to make sure that you do do you it. You do. You do. You've got to hire yourself. Cindy Crawford gave me a quote. and She goes, you know, I work for Cindy. I get up every day and I work for Cindy. And you have to get up and you have to work for whoever you are. And you have to believe in yourself and invest in yourself. You know, if these girls, you know, that they, they get... And I'm like this because I'm a mother now. Like, I get so overwhelmed that I, I'm still in my jogging pants at 2 o'clock. And I teach women, like, even if you've got nowhere to go and you've got a screaming baby, get dressed up to go to the grocery store. You'll feel good about yourself. Because if you find yourself five weeks and you're still in your sweatpants, trust me, it ain't going to be pretty. And, th- and that's got to help out when it comes to clearing out that closet. Because if you're collecting junk in there, then you're not moving forward. You're not. I mean, I am, I guess my mom, you know, I'm from, my mom is from the Depression era of like, um, of, of saving things and, 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 you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hoard this. I'm going to save this. I'm not going to do that. And I, and I was brought up like that. I was brought up to make sure and take care of my clothes because we didn't have a lot of things and we didn't have a lot of great things. But I realized that all this time when I started first modeling, I would save like these Chloe pants that I had put, you know, four months, $20 away so I could afford them. And then I saved them so long I never wore them. And so now I wear them. I don't wait to lose five pounds. I don't wait to gain five pounds. I'm more in the moment. And all the clutter, like I do it in my business life. I do it in my house life. I do it in my baby life. If I'm not using it and if I don't know someone who needs it, I get rid of it. You do realize this book isn't just for women. Clean mind. You do realize this book isn't just for women. I can see I can see guys at Barnes and Noble sneaking over to the corner going, man, she talks about a sweat koozie. I got to find out what she's talking about on this. Yeah, I mean, I've gained a lot of weight, you know, when I, I always tell men, like, they're like, well, how do you lose weight? I'm like, you got to get your ass in sweat. You got to sweat. Sweat, sweat, and sweat. If you're not sweating, you're not losing. And men, you guys are so lucky because you lose weight so easily. And you know, but it takes it, 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 which is so, It's so funny that you say that because old. I had to sit here and think, I go, real easy, but we also pack it on too quickly. And and that's what I found well, so interesting. You inter- pack it on because you love your beer and then, you know, <laughs> you, you love to like, you know, you're like a tackle of hens when you start watching football and sports. <laughs> and then you guys, you know, and then you meaning, meaningly, meaninglessly eat. So you guys can have your habits as well. And one one of my favorite chapters that you have in your book is where you start putting focus on on the natural things, the natural bee pollen, vitamin D, the omegas, kombucha. I mean, the, the uh, probiotics. What I love about this book is it is a lifestyle. This is not something that's going to... It's gonna... a lifestyle book, and it's a little bit for everyone. I tell you, you know, some people are like, oh, what exercise do you do? Well, I do hot yoga. I do Pilates. I, I hike. I run. I walk. I do everything. Like women who do the same thing and men who do the same thing every day, switch it up. And you don't, I mean, and you don't have to, you know, even belong to a gym. If you've got a floor or if you've got an outside walk, 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 sweat and walk, put on jogging pants. And I always say, you know, really layer. People are like, why are you in long sleeve while you're working out? I was like, because I'm going to sweat more. People always say, like, oh, do you you believe in fasting? I said, I only believe in fasting. I don't think it's going to, oh, my God, you're going to drop four pounds of water weight. Woo-hoo. But what it does do is that when you've done something for four days and you've put your mind to it, 
and you've accomplished that, it gives you confidence. It gives you willpower to go on, and you've also changed your taste buds. Yeah, does it fast work? Not really. It only helps your mind. In, in working with Tracy O'Connor, the, the style that you have chosen to present this book is what I call Twitter speak. You do it in the most easiest way for someone that could be driving or just passing through their house for them to understand it immediately. Well, that's the, well, that's so funny that you mentioned that because Tracy O'Connor is one of my best friends for 10 years. And when we were pitching to Harper Collins, we wrote a chapter and we wrote our outline. And they were like, well, she's only written one book. She wrote a great book for Kate Somerville. Um, and I was like, I know, but here, here's the difference. If I have a ghostwriter help me, they don't know me. They don't know who I am. But most importantly, this is how I speak. And if I'm randomly meeting someone I don't even know, I'm like, okay, you need to get your eyebrows done. Call me. I'll give you this number. Like, here's what you need to do. Like, I'm, that's, it is Twitter speak because it's real life. It's how I talk. And Tracy and I, we're kind of like the same. She's just a writer and I'm a talker. So we, she, we, we lay it out. We interview. We do our top ten, our takeaways, our, our tips. And that's what I wanted women to be able to, like, I didn't want, like, them to reading a freaking novel. <laughs> I'm mean, like, okay, how do I get this? How do I do that? And how long is it going to take me? The Lennon and McCartney of fashion. Thank you so much, Molly, for taking Thank the time so to talk much. with us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This is definitely one of those documentaries that needs to get into the hands of people all over the world because it will affect the way that we grow forward. The documentary is called Architects of Denial. Executive producers Dean Cain and Montel Williams will have the trailer at the end of our conversation. Hey, it's Errol. Inside the Rbeats Radio Studio at rbeats.com, unplugged and totally uncut with Montel Williams. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Doing very well. I want to congratulate you on taking your broadcasting career up to a higher level of expression because this right here, Architects of Denial, is still that connection to people, but at a much higher level. Well, I thank you so much, sir. This is something that was very important to me and so important to all of us who produce. Dean Cannon is one of the other executive producers. You know, this is something that, again, when you when you, you stop from it, and most of your listeners probably don't know what Architect of the is about, but it is about the Armenian Genocide of 1915. And we say, okay, and the continuing genocide today. And it's about the history of genocide. And we use... Armenia as the as the focal point, but trying to make sure people understand that a genocide denied is a genocide continued. And you know, most people again, I didn't know anything about the Armenian genocide before I got involved in this project. Somebody asked me, you know, do you want to get involved in this? I'm like, what? What Armenian genocide? But then when I started studying and looking and reading, considering myself, thinking myself to be a very educated person. I realized that I completely missed out on a part of history that's one of the most important parts of history of the last century. Yeah. Because 12 years after this happened, when Hitler was asked by his generals, how do you think we're going to get away with this? You're going to get away with this, this ultimate solution for Jewish people. And he said, no one remembers Armenia. Yep. Yep, yep. But the the work you've done in your career has been absolutely amazing. But uh, work like uh, Architects of Denial, the work that you've done in the community, activism, everything else. Do you feel that you get a, a little more fulfillment out of uh, out of that kind of work than just your in- entertainment career? Oh my brother, please understand. You know, a living is made is is a living is really acquired by or a living is achieved by what you make. A life is achieved by what you give. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't live on this planet for self alone. I've made my way. Um, and I think it's, it's so much more important for us to stop and reflect what we can do for our fellow man. Unfortunately, no, a lot of people in the world are doing that right now. That's the reason why we have the anger, the angst, the, the vitriol, the separation. The, the, but if we can stop for a minute and, and and for half a second put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And then consider trying to maybe help that person. I mean, put life's about that. I mean, you don't have a lot of time on this planet. Believe here and do things just for yourself is the most narcissistic and greedy thing you could possibly do. You know, to leave here making sure that you've done things for others, most important thing in life. Working side by side with Dean Kane, I mean, that gave you the opportunity. There, That's two creative minds and hearts in the same place. The meetings you must have had and knowing that you needed to still educate the people. 
And you and I have worked together on, on projects in Africa, from Feed the Children, Saving Homeless Kids. We're about to do another project for some of the Syrian refugees up to date because what people don't understand is that Syria, then the attacking of Aleppo, that was really the destruction of Christians in the middle of a all-Muslim nation. And they drove, in the last five years, have been driving Armenians out of Syria. Those Armenians are now refugees in their own homeland. And and so I mean it, it's these are the issues that, that Dean and I have been so profoundly you know moved by and Dean and I don't necessarily agree on everything politically, but we come together when it, it deals with humanity to show people you can put aside your differences for mankind and you know I, I, I this has been one of the, the the best journeys that I've been on but you know a lot of people don't I I spend ninety percent of it, I just took my first company public two years ago which is a company that's working on traumatic brain injury and deep brain using a device that's an experimental device it's called a portable neuromodulation device that will have implications hopefully after we prove it out in clinical trials and everything from MS to Parkinson's to stroke to ADD to, D, you know, to, to any neurological disease. We're working on it very diligently trying to pull together the clinical trials to achieve the results that will prove this. We just finished a clinical trial of traumatic brain injury from mild to moderate. These are the things that, that give me pleasure in life to be able to work on, to promote, and to be able to do because it makes a difference. All the other angst and, and, and silliness is, is to me you know, just a, a form of patting yourself on the back and narcissism. Well, the movie we're talking about, or the documentary, is Architects of Denial. I, I want to thank you for giving yourself permission to become a part of this project. You were called to be a leader in this, and what a brilliant heart you've got, sir. No, thank you so much, sir. And again, I want people to recognize and understand, and I'm not talking about this current set of leaders in America today, but we are only one leader away from a tyrant who could do the same here inside the United States. Hey, if you'd like to find out some more information about Architects of Denial and hear other incredible conversations, rbeats.com, unplugged and totally uncut, on demand. My family lived in this village for centuries. We love this land and we will never leave it. overwhelming evidence to support that there was a serious Armenian genocide. The deliberate destruction of an entire people. Forcibly marching women and children to death. Parties at the time sending back cables, newspaper reports, eyewitnesses and so on. Turkey has gone around the world aggressively lobbying to make sure there are no references to the Armenian genocide. And why do they kill us? Just because we're not one of them. We're different. Armenian people have been running for generation after generation. At least a million and a half were killed. The most brutal forms of killing. Somebody shouted, open the door, we will kill all Armenians. Denial may continue for a hundred years or more afterwards. You can get away with murder, literally, and nothing will happen to you. Major powers, such as the United States, do not recognize the Armenian genocide. Governments say we are doing this, but sometimes we have to do evil deeds because the end justifies the means. I have received more gag orders than any other person in the history of this country. I've been witnessing criminal activities which constitutes treason. Deny the facts. Deny the statistics. Do you deny that the Armenian genocide happened? I do deny that. So they kept beating him and he kept walking. I saw two people being killed. I saw this with my own eyes. How is 1.5 million deaths not a genocide? Is the Turkish lobby not allowing you to answer this question? I want people to know the truth. Hitler once famously said, who remembers Armenia? The answer is the whole world. That's who. This is an important question because Christian Armenians are being killed and persecuted to this day.